Thanks, Catalina. And uh, thank you all for, for having me here. Um, my name is San Ho Tree. I'm a fellow at the Institute of Policy Studies, where for the past 12 years I've been working on uh, drug policy issues, primarily international counter-narcotics policies, and looking at why they failed. Doing a lot of work on Plant Columbia and also the Merida Initiative. Uh, but I started looking at the uh, by looking at the demand side uh, in the United States. And so it's unfortunate that we uh, we have to learn about these countries in the United States through the, uh, the, the prism of, of, of conflict and war and crime and things. There's an old joke that uh, war is God's way of teaching Americans geography. Right? Um, unfortunately, this is, this is what we're, we're here to do tonight. But I want to talk a little bit behind the, uh, what's going on behind the scenes in terms of the drug war. Um, Catalina did a great job of giving you an overview of the numbers involved and where the Merit Initiative came from. Um, but why is this happening? This, this level of violence in Mexico, Actually, let me put this a different way. The rate of murders in Mexico is actually lower today than it was 15 years ago, um, per cap, per 100,000. The problem is that uh, back then it was more common crime and dispersed. Now, what you're seeing is spectacular levels of violence, incredible violence. And they're focused in, in specific regions, particularly in the border regions and strategic ports of entries where the various uh, traffickers are, are fighting over, over routes, smuggling routes. But this should not be happening. What these traffickers, um, they're, they're called DTOs, drug trafficking organizations. They're not called cartels. Cartels are misnomer. Mis 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 cartels suggest that they're actually working together in collusion to, 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 to fix prices and stuff. They're working against each other, killing each other. Uh, so technically, we call them DTOs rather than cartels. If you want to see what a cartel looks like, look at the health insurance industry in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you have these DTOs fighting uh, a turf war. And all this bloodshed and all these reprisal killings and, and things, what they're fighting over are essentially minimally processed agricultural commodities that aren't worth very much at all. They're pennies per dose in the real world, all right? So we're talking about things like marijuana, cocaine, heroin. They have very, very little real value to them. They're easy to produce. Um, and, and, and there's nothing magical. There's no magical properties about these plants. They're easy to grow. They're easy to refine. Uh, marijuana will grow in all 50 states in the United States. It's the number one cash crop in, in many of our states. Um, poppies, where we get opium and, and heroin from, will grow in all 50 states. Um, it's the state flower of California. It's, it's grown well in Mexico as well. Coca will grow in any climate that doesn't freeze, basically. It'll grow in the, in the, in the high Andes. It'll also grow in, in the Amazon basin. It'll also grow in sub-Saharan Africa. Indonesia, before World War II, was a major exporter of cocaine. We used to have plantations of coca in, in Hawaii. Uh, back in the day, Taiwan, Iwo Jima, they used to grow large plantations of cocoa once upon a time before World War II. Um, so there's, and, and, and the reason these things have such value is the policy of, of prohibition that we have, the war on drugs, right? And the same way that um, prohibition of alcohol made alcohol astronomically more valuable than, than what it really goes for, it's the risk reward involved in this. So our politicians see that drug abuse and addiction can cause a lot of harm to individuals. Their knee-jerk reaction is, well, we have to have a war on this stuff. This will, that, that'll show that we're serious about a war on these things. Um, you can't have a war against inanimate objects. Um, plants don't surrender. Um, they don't respond to professional threats. Um, they, they, they follow the laws of nature and the laws of the market, not the laws of Congress. And then here's the problem. Um, the more law enforcement and the more military uh, resources Congress throws at this problem, the more valuable the drugs become. And the reason is that uh, at each step of the smuggling operation, right, whether you're, you're smuggling from Colombia to, to Central America or from Mexico or across the border, the higher the risk to the individual smuggler, the higher the premium, the higher the reward they can charge the next person down the smuggling chain. That is to say, as Congress throws more resources at this, more police, the higher the risk that I'm going to get captured and have to serve a long prison sentence, the more I'm going to charge the next person down the line. So we build in this incredible price support, uh, an unintended crop subsidy, if you will. Uh, Republicans ought to be against this. <laughs> they are against subsidies, unless it's a certain corporation. That's another matter. Uh, so we have this vicious cycle that as this situation gets worse, our politicians can only think of knee-jerk reactions. And they keep throwing more resources, uh, law enforcement resources to coerce our way out of this problem which then just creates more risk in this, in this economy. And yes, we'll, we will pick off some inefficient traffickers and whatnot, but the ones who survive make a lot more money as a result of these policies. And as they make more money, it attracts more people into this economy. 
people think, oh, this is my chance now. And so, and the other unintended consequence, the, in, the other indirect consequence of this policy is that we have forced this economy to evolve at a lightning pace. Um, it, it's, it's the, I call it the Darwinian um, response to, to our law enforcement. So that as our politicians um, throw, throw more policing at this problem, what it does is it thins out the herd. You get a filtering effect. So that the people we typically capture are the people who are dumb enough to get caught. No offense if anyone's been ever been arrested for anything, but, but the slang on the street is that the dealer who uses loses. Right? You get careless, you get sloppy, you get apprehended. Similarly, at the macro level, this is what happens with, with, with throwing more law, law enforcement at this problem. We end up picking off the, the clumsy traffickers, the inefficient traffickers. And the, the, the flip side of that argument is that we tend to leave behind the most efficient traffickers, the ones who are really cunning, really smart, and really less violent, actually. Right? The, the, the traffickers who are going to survive this current turf war are the ones you're not hearing about today. They're laying low. Killing each other is bad for business, and, and, and it, it tends to, to kill off the more experienced people. You get younger people taking the place. They're the ones who are the hot-headed ones. They don't have a lot of experience. They know how to use a lot of violence, but they don't last very long. And so, over the decades, we've had this uh, unintended policy of artificial selection. We've been selectively breeding for super traffickers because of the, the reckless way in which we apply law enforcement. I'm not saying we shouldn't have law enforcement. I'm just saying we use it in such a blind and stupid way that we end up filtering uh, and, and, and we've been selectively breeding super traffickers. We can't hope to war a, win a war on drugs when your policies see to it that only the most efficient operations survive. And not only do they survive, they thrive because we've done two things unintentionally to help them. Number one, we've eliminated the competition for them. We've gotten rid of the inefficient traffickers who are competing against them, thereby opening up that economic space to the, to the remaining efficient traffickers. And number two, we tried to constrict the supply of uh, drugs on the street. Well, the demand remains the same, thereby driving up prices and profits. Right? So that's, a, again, another one of the reasons why throwing more money at this problem has, has had just the, the opposite results. Um, and this is why you're getting people like uh, former President Fox coming out just recently saying legalization should be an option. We need to debate that. Um, previously, last year, President Cedillo, former president of Mexico again, different president said also we need to talk about legalization, decriminalization. Um, uh, foreign minister, former Foreign Minister Castaneda also is on record supporting legalization. Uh, and similarly, in other countries, President Gaviria, former president of Colombia, as well as uh, former President Cardoso of Brazil, have all come out in favor of, of ending the war on drugs, talking about a legalized uh, system of regulation, or, or legalization, if you will. And certainly beginning with, with cannabis, uh, that this is a no-brainer, there's too much violence involved, and we, that these things should not be valuable. Cannabis, we call it weed for a reason. It grows like a weed, um, and there's no reason it should be fetching Four hundred dollars an ounce. Uh, this is this is insanity. It's a uh, it's one half of a price of it. And uh, actually, I'll give you an example of this. In uh, California, you, people know what Prop 19 was last November, right? The, the ballot initiative to legalize, tax, and regulate marijuana. It it won 46 and a half percent of the vote in California. It came very very close to passing. Two counties that voted against it. Humboldt County and Mendocino County. <laughs> All right, these, this is the, uh, the Emerald Triangle of, of Northern California. This is the pot capital of the United States. This is where they grow. It grows everywhere up there. And they voted against Prop 19. Why? They wanted prohibition. They want a little bit of law enforcement. Not too much. They don't want to get caught, but they want some other people down the road to get caught. That risk reward is what gives them their, their money. Otherwise, they can't command the kinds of prices they've been commanding. So that, and the same with the drug, with, with the drug trafficking organizations. The last ones who want to end this are the traffickers themselves. And so we have this, this situation of a turf war uh, in Mexico. Then. President uh, Calderon came into office. I won't say he was elected. He came into office <laughs> um, right about the time that the turf war was, was starting to, to, to really sprout up. And he behaved as a classical, tough, conservative guy. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to kick some ass. I'm going to bring the military into this. I'll show them. This is the worst thing you could have done in the midst of a turf war. Um, and I'll give you an analogy by way of, of, of local uh, uh, turf battles. In Baltimore, where I started working a dozen years ago, um, some of the veteran police were, were against shutting down open-air drug markets. Why? 
right? There's a right down the street, you know, officer, there, there's an open and drug market, this is where people are coming, they're buying and selling out in the open, I want you to shut it down. Uh, they know better than to do that nowadays, unless you have a really good plan B. The reason is that if you take, the reason these, these open and drug markets are valuable is because it's where people know to go to buy drugs. It's a valuable piece of real estate. Right? People, and usually from the suburbs, come in in their cars, you can see the license plate from the suburbs, to buy the drugs in the cities, very often white people, by the way. Uh, but this is where they come to buy drugs. And if you shut that down, if you take that dealer off the corner, you can't, you know, the traffickers can't uh, say, can't take out a Yellow Pages ad or put up a billboard saying, we moved 10 blocks over that direction, now go buy your drugs over there. There is no legal way for them to, 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 to do that. And so when you take a dealer off that street corner, what you do is you open up a very valuable piece of real estate. You created a job opening. Okay? And so then you have rival gangs coming in from different parts of the city fighting for that street corner because this is the place where people know to go to buy drugs. It's valuable. Right? So they fill that vacuum. And when you have rival gangs coming in, taking you to the same street corner, they're going to clash. How can they resolve their differences? They can't go to a judge and say, Your Honor, I've been dealing drugs in this city for 15 years, and this upstart gang from across town took over my turf. Kick them out, please. They can't do that. The only way they can settle their disputes are through violence or threats of extreme violence. At the macro level, this is what we're seeing in, in Mexico. Right? They're fighting particularly along the border regions and some of the coastal cities because that's where the ports of entry are. And that's how you smuggle to the United States. This is where the tunnels are located. This is where you have your list of people you, you, you bribe to smuggle across the border, et cetera, et cetera. So these are very valuable strategic uh, smuggling routes. And so you have this turf war amongst uh, half a dozen or so different drug trafficking organizations. When Calderon comes in and decides to use the military to attack them all, what he does is it creates a, a disequilibrium. What, they're, what the turf war is about is, is, is a sh what it should be is a short, violent period of fighting over turf. But at the end of which, we, we, we draw the map. I will deal in this area, and this will be my area. You will deal in that part of the country. You will deal in the Pacific Coast. You will deal in the... Uh, and we, we go back to our corners, and we go back to the quiet business of making lots of money. This is how it used to operate. Right? And it has to do with, the, 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 in 2000, the, the pre lost its political monopoly. Then you, the traffickers didn't know who to bribe along with the, you know, the, the border governments, etc. Um, turn war started to erupt, etc. But what this does, when you have, when you bring the military in to attack all of these drug trafficking organizations, is this dynamic of, as soon as one is weakened, the others think, ah, this is our chance to take over their turf. And so they gang up on that one, and then you start attacking a different cartel, uh, drug trafficking organization, and the others think, ah, this is our turf chance now to go after their turf. And so you'll never get this, this resolution, this Pax Narcotica, which is what they're fighting over. Uh, eventually there will be a Pax Narcotica, they'll go back to the quiet business of of trafficking again, um, we keep postponing that final day of reckoning, where they'll go back to, to their orderly business of drug dealing. And so that's the nature of a turf war. Um, as long as you have high demand, um, you're going to have this problem. 